Good evening everybody. This is the second webinar in the three-part Enhance the Tool of Your Trade webinar series. Tonight we're going to hear from both Laura Hancock of Rural Works, followed by Samantha McBride of Live Me Well. Um, so thank you very much for those of you who have joined both Sam and I last week and this week. And for anybody who's new, thank you very much for joining in on webinar two. So last week, we talked about enhancing your work style. And we learned that through understanding how to move wise, you can take more ownership of looking after your body, the tool of your trade. So we're really focused in this webinar series that your body is the most utilized tool of your trade in rural industries. So we're giving you tips and tricks as to how you can look after that tool of your trade. And by doing so, this puts more control of the longevity of your career back in your own hands. So this week, we'll be focusing on how you can enhance your lifestyle. So how you can help yourself to live wise. So firstly, I thought we would touch on the definition of lifestyle because it's a very well known and well used term. So we often hear that people aim to live a healthy lifestyle. It's a common goal. And to be honest, it's a much discussed topic. So lifestyle is defined as the habits, attitudes, tastes, moral standards, economic level that together constitute the mode of living of an individual or a group. So if we actually put that in simple terms, basically lifestyle means the way in which a person lives. So we covered last week that our modern work styles and lifestyles mean we don't actually move naturally anymore, not as our bodies were designed to. So our ancestors were hunter gatherers and these traits are still ingrained within our own DNA but we no longer use our natural basic movement patterns throughout our day, every day. And these are things like running, jumping, crawling, rolling, bending, balancing, bouncing and squatting. But instead, through repetitive and physically demanding rural work, or as a result of a past injury, we're actually losing our range of motion for basic movement patterns. And we might be stiffening up and developing poor posture and certainly we're often utilizing poor movement to perform our everyday working tasks. So as we've said in webinar one, modern life is effectively getting in the way of us moving well. So learning to move wise, having warrants of movements and utilizing movement snacks throughout our daily routines, which is what we discussed last week, is a very important aspect of learning to move wise and to move well in your daily life again. But to discuss living well, I come back to the fact that genes that govern our bodies today actually evolved hundreds of years ago. So then we were in constant motion. So we were foraging, hunting, chasing animals across the plains for hours. But then those people would come home, they'd eat, rest, sleep, recover and relax and then repeat the whole process again. But today, of course, our lifestyle has dramatically changed from that. But our genes, our bodies, and our brains are still encoded for the lifestyle which our ancestors lived. So not only is modern life getting in the way of us moving well, it is also getting in the way of us living well. So it's really clear that our modern work styles and lifestyles have a notable effect, not only on our movement patterns and our physical health, but also upon us living well. And a key topic that shows us this is the constant conversation around stress in our modern lives. It's a common word. It's used in terminology so often. And we've all undoubtedly experienced it in some form of another at some stage in our lives. And we can certainly clearly see why all New Zealand farmers are under a lot of pressure and therefore stress just from the nature of their industry. And now those of you who are farming in drought regions are under increased and more long-term pressure on top of those normal everyday stresses of your industry. 
So in order to help yourself manage these pressures, we need to have some tools in the toolbox to help us deal with stress. But first, we need to understand fundamentally what is stress. And that's what Sam's going to take us through now for the first part of our webinar. So I'm just going to stop sharing my screen so that we can transfer to Sam. Good evening, everyone. Yeah, I hope that everybody can hear me now. Um, and yeah, so as Laura's highlighted, um, lifestyle is the way in which a person lives. And if we recap from last week, there were eight key modifiable lifestyle factors that can influence this. By far, the one that's getting talked about most at the moment is stress. The stress is often named the disease of this century. And whilst we appreciate that the weather is inevitable, as we've talked about, stress is also created through this new way that we're living that we hadn't been designed to for so long. So to give you a better idea of what we can do to help ourselves, help mitigate the effect, today we're going to look at stress, how we have a choice, not necessarily on what's causing us the stress, but certainly um, gives us some more options on how we can manage it. So stress is bad, right? Well, not always. It's a great survival mechanism. That fight or flight um, stops us having car crashes, helps us pull our kids off the road. Sometimes getting fired up is a really crucial part for our well-being. It's the main reason that our ancestors survived their encounters with the bears and the lions and that we're muddling our way through this 21st century. But we still need these times where we're experiencing tunnel vision and we have blood rushing through our veins. And again, it can be a good thing. As you're all aware, um, if you know that there's going to be a big weather situation, Having that bit of stress really helps you perform, um, helps you focus on the job and helps get that job done. In other areas of life, um, it can be relevant in things like courage before dating. And all we're doing is just gearing up our body to perform at its best under pressure. It's a really the great mechanism to get shit done. Stress is only harmful for your health when it's constant and it doesn't get a chance to switch itself off. It's important to remember that everybody has different things that impact them and what impacts our stress may not necessarily be the same as somebody else. And in our modern life, things like work, money, lifestyle, life changes, even socially keeping up with the um, Joneses, certainly traumas and health, and that little bit of competition that you can get between people, can all add to leading to more areas of stress in your life. Most people would instantly think of mental and emotional pressure as being the, the main um, causes of stress. And lots of people don't necessarily think of the fact that there are other elements that are causing stress in our system as well. So we're just going to run through them quickly. And mentally um, is, is as we'd expect. It's those thought processes that uh, provoke that stress response. Uh, this is the category most people commonly think of straight away. Um, work, in this case, is often the biggest stressor. And this makes sense because that sustained mental focus and effort can obviously be challenging, especially when um, we're living in pretty stressful times and, and certainly the weather and the environment aren't playing their part for us. So this is the stuff that churns around in our head, keeps us awake at night um, and that we ruminate over on a regular basis. We don't often think um, about the physical side of stress. And this can be either the fact that we're doing hard work all day, or it can be that we've sustained a physical injury, maybe a broken bone or, or something similar. Our body gives it a similar response. It puts more energy into doing both of those things, um, to fixing the body or to making it perform for long periods of time. But um, it's still ultimately releasing the extra energy into the system. And physiologically, it's not that dissimilar a result to mental stress. Emotionally, is um, that's when really we hit on those big negative feelings that just shoot straight into us. We get angry, we get fear, 
and it goes straight into um, the emotional part of our brain, which doesn't really make a lot of sense and goes straight into our fight or flight response. And you make snap judgments. Um, when we're angry, we snap. Um, when we're hurt, we can often say hurtful things back straight away. Um, so it's not necessarily something that a lot of logic necessarily comes out when we're getting that emotional hurt. And it can very quickly turn back into that mental stress and we'll start thinking about it more often and ruminating. We also don't think um, nowadays with um, such a plentiful supply of food that nutritional stress um, can be a big problem for us. Um, certainly in the past, in times of extreme starvation, nutrition was really um, a really, really relevant part to the stress response. Now, whilst we've got plenty of calories around, we don't necessarily have all the nutrients and minerals and vitamins we're getting from our food, especially if we're eating a, a fairly high level of packaged food diet. And so really focusing on making sure that we're not adding extra stress onto our body by eating those real foods um, can be really beneficial. And lastly, as we talked last week, there are so many more toxins in the environment. And that's before we're looking at the things like um, snake bites or um, poisons that, that are coming from other areas. It is really interesting that the two things we go to traditionally when we're stressed and that lots of people use for stress relief, or the three things, sorry, one's food, and lots of people aren't sat, sat there feeling stressed and actually going for the, for the fruit and veggie or a really nice piece of quality steak. Uh, most people are going for the chocolate and the biscuits, or we're going for a beer or for a wine, or if we smoke, we tend to smoke and all of those things tend to be exacerbated and used more as stress relievers. However, it is worth noting that all of those things are actually adding an extra stress burden when we're using them. So um, just have a think about that when you are under stress. I know, I know I used to come in from work and have a glass of wine to relax and wind down, but it's not necessarily the best thing actually physiologically for you. So there are three key types of stress. My clicker's not working there. There we go. Um, acute, so we talked about that, that short term. It can be a really good thing. And if it's really traumatic, um, then that's when we have that lasting impact. And that's that, that traumatic trauma really can turn to chronic very quickly. And so at any time of that, you can address it. That would be um, really, really good sooner rather than later. If those short term stresses keep repeating themselves, and we keep finding ourselves in situations like rushing, um, or you get reoccurring stresses at home or at work. These can be managed when we actually become aware of them. Uh, but very often, um, these things that repeat again and again and again, we often get more and more wound up by them, but don't actually sit back and think, well, either what can I do about it, or can I learn to just accept it? So. Um, Women commonly at home, it's the toilet seat up. Men often get upset with us nagging. Um, me, chewing loudly is a really, really big one that winds me up. And it's only recently that I thought, well, this is actually my problem, not somebody else's. Um, and if I take that stress on and let it wind me up, then that's my fault and it's not doing me any good. Chronic is the thing that we need to be worried about. That's where um, at the long-term stress, really starts to make a big difference to our physiology um, and it can be created from anything from illnesses from relationships from financial problems but that's when we start getting chronically stressed and we can't start seeing a way out of that situation that's when we really need to be quite proactive about addressing it so we've got two key nervous system states we've got the sympathetic nervous system that's the fight or flight the thing that actually you know when we're in danger makes us more alert gives us lots of energy and allows us to be in a position to actually you know fight or flee the parasympathetic and i always think you need a parachute that's going to save you that's the rest digest and restore this is what our body needs this is what we need to actually help ourselves recuperate. And it's not just for stress, it's for all of our physiological systems. So um, it's really important that if we're spending a lot of time in this sympathetic, we do actively try and get ourselves back into that parasympathetic system. So what actually happens to our body during that fight or flight? Well, 
in a nutshell, the blood prioritizes going to the brain and the extremities and the muscles sending energy there so we can fight or flee. This is great um, for when, as we mentioned earlier, for getting stuff done. Um, during the floods in Southland, when we knew they were coming, we managed to get all the stock um, into high ground and look after them. But if it keeps going on and on and on, um, like the effects after the floods or the drought that so many of you guys in the North Island have experienced, this stress response um, starts to become our norm. So just quickly, physiologically, what can it do? Well, it dilates our pupils so we can see um, and focus more easily. It stops, gives us a dry mouth. Um, we don't need to digest food if we're going to be fighting in a minute. Makes our lungs relax. We get more oxygen um, into our blood to get more energy. Our heart rate goes up so our blood can go further again to get more energy out to our extremities more quickly. Just like our mouth, our stomach stops digesting food. The liver will release as much glucose as it can into the system. Our kidneys release the stress hormone that controls all of these responses. And as we all know, when we start getting a bit nervous, we need to go to the bathroom. And what happens to our body then in the long term? And this is quite heavy, but it, it's something that I feel is really important that we just get a little bit of an awareness that stress isn't just a mental problem and it doesn't just affect, affect us mentally, which we're all really aware of, but it can actually have some quite profound physiological effects. So as far as our immunity goes, we get the stress input. Um, it rings an alarm in our brain, stimulates that stress hormone, that cortisol comes out. That then suppresses the immune system. And quite simply, if we're getting a bit of a cold or even the dreaded COVID, if you're stressed, your body's protecting you from that imminent danger. To be honest, if a tiger's gonna get you today, it really doesn't matter if you're gonna get the flu tomorrow. So in the long term, suppressing that immune system can lead to lots of other autoimmune things going on. For example, arthritis or multiple sclerosis, and the immune system also has a really important job in mopping up cells that are going a bit wonky that could eventually turn cancerous if they're not um, looked after. So there's a longer ch an increased chance of illness over the long term by that suppressed immunity. And physiologically, we can also see how it leads to some of our most common chronic diseases. Again, that stress input, the brain rings that alarm bell, uh, exhibits the flight or fight response and we get an increase in blood pressure, increase in heart rate and increase in blood glucose and from those things it's really easy to see, it's not hard to see that cardiovascular disease is going to go up, uh, that increased um, in blood in the brain is going to lead to more migraines and that increase in blood sugar is going to increase our chance of diabetes. In fact stress has been shown to be attributed to about 90% of all chronic diseases. And again, you know, we think about that mental health side of things and, um, you know, the, the fact that, that stress obviously can lead to anxiety and depression, but it does lots of other things to the brain as well. And essentially, um, stress can make you pretty stupid. And if we look about how the brain's actually evolved, we started with um, the reptilian brain. And this has got a really, really simple functions. It works at a subconscious level. Its primary role makes sure that our um, primary functions, our breathing, our heartbeat, all happens, and it allows us to spread our genes. So it's focused on survival. It's focused on eating and keeping warm. Um, you wanna kill or be killed, and you want to reproduce. This um, brain shows no mercy and has no concept of uh, learning from any of its mistakes. As we move through evolution a little bit, um, we go into that emotional limbic brain. Um, and that's where we start cooperating. We see um, dogs working as packs. Uh, we start forming bonds between um, animals. We get a memory, we can learn things and learn um, how to repeat things and learn what's safe and what's not safe. And, and get some sort of control over our appetite. And then this beautiful thing that separates us um, as primates and humans from the rest of the mammalian world, we get this beautiful, lovely, big neocortex or this rational brain, and we can plan now and we can interpret things and we can control ourselves. And we're really, really good at 
problem solving. And this makes us a pretty um, special and amazing um, being really. However, if we look at the brain that's under stress and we do an MRI, it's this reptilian brain here and this is the picture that comes up. So when we're under stress, lots of blood goes to the brain, but it's purely focused on survival. It's not actually worrying about what anybody else thinks or how we're going to affect anybody else. And it's certainly not putting us in this wonderful problem solving space that's going to make all the difference and make some help make some really good decisions for us. The other thing we just need to consider is when thoughts come in and when stuff's happening in our brain, is it real? And do we know the difference? If we sit in front of the television, um, how many of us, uh, I know I do, will cry at an emotional movie? We know that if we start watching Jaws, we're in the comfort of our own home, we're perfectly safe, but we hear that da dum da dum da dum and we still feel it and we still jump when he comes out the water. This is our body getting really confused with what's perceived and what's real. And this happens to us when all sorts of thoughts are coming in. So it's really, really hard for us to actually stop and think about what's really going on. This can happen in a really positive way as well as a negative way. If we think about um, like really, really good athletes that have been injured, while they're lying in bed, if they visualize doing, um, if they visualize doing their sport on a regular basis during their recovery, compared to an athlete who hasn't done the um, same exercise, they lose remarkably less muscle mass than those that don't do the visualization. So your brain's really powerful in actually creating things physiologically without actually necessarily having um, the actual input to, that you would imagine would have to make it happen. So how can we reduce stress? Well, where do we start? Well, for me, the most important thing is awareness. Making a mental or actual note every time you start to feel stressed, you'll become more aware of what your own stresses are. And just like we've all got our own fingerprint and we've all got our own DNA, how stress manifests is unique to all of us as well. We can become irritable, we can eat more, we can eat less, we can get headaches, we can be more sensitive, um, and we can get a multitude of signs and symptoms. And it's really up to us to start trying to be aware of whether these things are ailments or whether they're caused by stress. So what I'd really love for people to take away from this is just over the next week, try and acknowledge when you're feeling a strong negative emotion or when you're feeling one of the things that you think, God, I often do that when I'm a bit stressed. Just becoming aware of it. You don't need to fix it. You don't need to do anything with it at all. Just noticing it is really one of the biggest steps in moving forward and being able to start thinking about managing it. So if you are noticing that it's coming at the same time every day or um, there's a similar person around every day, maybe try and make a note of, of that. Because if there is any repetition and it's an episodic stress, you may be able to do something to mitigate it. When we're feeling aware of that stress, um, having some sort of relaxation that we think about should become a priority. And again, just like how we manifest it in completely separate ways, what's going to relax us again are gonna be completely individual things. So we're gonna cover a few more ideas of things like that um, over, the, over the next wee while. But one of the key things that we can do is learn to breathe properly. So breathing is the only easy switch we have. As the diaphragm pushes down on the vagus nerve, this is the only instant way we say to the brain, hey, you're safe. Drop that fight or flight response. I teach breathing often. Um, to, where I teach it to everybody that, that I coach. Laura, as a movement coach, can actually make this beneficial for your movement and core and as a stress response. And I love any two for the price of one deal. 
So I'm going to hand this over now to Laura to run through making sure that you learn how to breathe properly as the most important tool in your stress toolkit. Cool. So hopefully you can all see my slides there. So as Sam just mentioned, breathing is such a huge part of our daily lives and it's probably the most simple, but yet also the most complex thing we do. The reason I say this is it's a conscious thing if we want it to be, we can control it if we choose to. But then when we stop thinking about breathing, it continues on its own. So there's a really strong link between psychology and physiology. So basically what I'm saying is between the mind and the body, there's a seriously strong connection and link. And we all know that in tense, pressured and stressful situations, psychology causes the body to become tense. Now you see people tighten up and they've got that, that stressed, tight, tense feeling about their body, even though that's actually going on in their mind. So at this stage, we're firing on our sympathetic nervous system. So that's that fight and flight response that Sam mentioned. And breathing exercises are really powerful because they can help us have a positive impact upon both our psychology and our physiology. So good breathing practices can help activate that sympathetic nervous system. And our sympathetic nervous system is our rest, digest and restore response. And breathing can therefore help us calm both the mind and the body at the same time. So that's that two for one bonus that Sam just mentioned to us. So the thing is that through years of dysfunctional posture and repetitive movement patterns, breathing can actually become suboptimal. And this occurs for many reasons in every individual's life. And firstly, we've got psychological reasons that can change the way we breathe and make, make us breathe suboptimally. And things like anxiety, stress and panic are going to fit into this category. Personality traits even, suppressed emotions, conditioned and learned responses actually change the way we breathe, as well as a history of abuse and certainly pain. Then we've got biochemical reasons. So this is things like drugs, caffeine, alcohol, opiates. And we all know we can breathe differently when it's hot or humid different altitudes and even allergies can affect the way we breathe. And then a huge one, of course, is biomechanical reasons. And this is things like postural adaptions. So if we're slouching or we're sat at a desk all day or driving in a truck, we kind of shut down our rib cage and we round through our shoulders. And this means that instead of coming into the rib cage with our breath, it has to be directed more into the upper chest rather than the lower chest and the rib cage. So that's hugely changed the way we breathe just from our postural change. And often as a stress response, we can also breathe through our mouth instead of the more optimal nasal breathing. Even things like tight waisted clothing can change the way we breathe. And certainly overuse, misuse and abuse of our musculoskeletal system can also have an effect. And then because we've got these psychological, biochemical and biomechanical reasons that our breath can change and become suboptimal, over time, this unfortunately can then become habit. So then we're breathing suboptimally throughout our day, every day. So in order to avoid that suboptimal breathing, or in order to help reverse suboptimal breathing patterns that we've developed, it's really important that we pay attention to our breathing as a vital part of our effort to both move wise and also to live wise. Because as we said, breathing exercises can have a powerful positive effect upon both psychology and physiology. So correct breathing technique can help support relaxation. So as we just said, it's kicking into that rest, digest, restore response of the parasympathetic nervous system. But interestingly, it can also help us physiologically reduce stress and tension because as we breathe into the rib cage, as we technically should with good diaphragmatic breathing, it's going to mobilize those areas that we actually hold that physical stress and tension. 
Very interestingly, good breathing can also improve our core stabilization. So that's a really powerful thing when we're at work, increasing our core stability. We'll discuss this in a minute. Then good breathing techniques can improve posture. So if you think about it, if we're good breathing, open chest, open body, that's opening up our posture as well. But then in reverse, good posture is also going to help us have good breathing. And then lastly, it's also going to improve our performance. If we can improve our breathing patterns, we've got more efficient respiration. This is going to increase the oxygen availability in our body. And it's also going to stimulate positive chemical responses that is then going to improve our performance in our daily life. So you can see just by breathing well, we've got a host of really powerful effects that we can uh, initiate in our body. So the diaphragm is the main muscle which we use to initiate the breathing process. So you can see in that picture on the right there that the diaphragm is attached to the spine. And then in the other photograph, you'll see it's also attached to the ribs and the breastbone. So good diaphragmatic breathing, meaning when we use our diaphragm efficiently, provides a connection that transmits force efficiently throughout the entire body. So as we breathe in, that dome-shaped muscle that is the diaphragm contracts and it drops down. As it drops down, air enters into the lungs and fills those lungs. So because of that diaphragm dropping down, we should see that belly rise. So the diaphragm contracts, it compresses the abdominal space and the belly rises. That's where we hear a lot about um, belly breathing. But also the lower ribs should expand out to the sides and to the back of the body. So effectively, we're looking at 360 degree breath in that rib cage. So when we think about this, it makes a little bit of sense, actually, that diaphragm plays a key role in core stabilization because efficient diaphragmatic breathing creates intra-abdominal pressure because as the diaphragm compresses the abdominal space, it creates that pressure within the abdomen and that in itself is going to aid our core stability. Now, not only does the diaphragm or uh, well, diaphragmatic breathing help core stabilization. It's also an actually really key tool to help improve movement. So last week we discussed that if our body is seen as a chain, then poor movement patterns can be seen as a weak link. And the exciting thing is that good breathing techniques impact movement. So as a movement coach, when I discover weak links through warrant of movements, I can then prescribe breathing exercises. And it's extremely common to see improvements in the weak link that we discovered immediately after performing breathing exercises. In fact, approximately 70% of people will see improvement in their movement after performing good diaphragmatic breathing exercises. And similar observations are supported by research as well. So as we covered last week, a weak link is going to determine the strength and the durability of the chain which is your body. So if we can improve the weak link, improving movement just through breathing exercises, this means that we can improve the durability of your chain, your body, by incorporating breathing exercises into your daily routines. So let's look at how we can integrate good breathing techniques into our daily routines as a movement snack. So I'm going to ask you all, hopefully, to position yourself like in the photographs on the slides here. So hopefully you're sitting on a chair. So if you can lie yourselves down on the ground in what we call a 90-90 position. So you're going to be face up so that your back is on the floor and you're going to put your calves on the chair or sofa that you've been sitting on so that your knees and hips are both bent to 90 degrees. So hopefully you're all popping yourselves down to the ground to join in with this breathing exercise because it's a really lovely one to learn. Now, when you're lying down on the ground here, your neck and your spine should be kind of natural position, nice and comfortable. If you happen to have a posture that means your head's tilting back, just grab yourself a little pillow there, hopefully off the sofa and pop your head until it's in a natural, comfortable position. I'm gonna ask you to take one hand and pop it onto your chest 
and the other hand is going to go spread like a starfish onto your belly as in this picture here. So we're going to be focusing on belly breathing. You can keep your shoulders and neck soft and relaxed. And lying here, I'm going to ask you to breathe in through your nose and pause for a couple of seconds, filling those lungs, and then breathe out through your nose. And with empty lungs, pause again. And then continue breathing in, pausing with full lungs, breathe out through your nose, and pause with empty lungs. So if you can continue this for me whilst I continue to chat to you with more information. So we're focusing on this belly breathing. So the hand on your belly should naturally be rising first and the hand on your chest rising afterwards. So we want to focus on directing the breath down into the belly for that optimal diaphragmatic breath. Now, if you find that your breath is primarily coming into your chest with little belly movement, or it's coming into your chest before your belly, that's totally okay. Because this exercise will help you to reset that breathing pattern so that it become more optimal. And a really good tool to help you do this, because if you're breathing suboptimally, it's kind of ingrained into your system at the moment. So we can use visualization because that's gonna help us uh, imagine what it should be like and help us retrain this breath. So what I'd like you to imagine is that there's a balloon attached to the bottom of your diaphragm. And as you breathe in, you're going to imagine that you're drawing your breath right down into your belly in order to blow that balloon up. So on every in-breath, we're directing that breath right down into that belly so that the hand can rise on the belly more than it does on the chest. So we're going to stay in this position, but now what I'm going to ask you to do is take your hands to the side of your body, spread your fingers and wrap them around your rib cage. Thumbs at the back of your rib cage and fingers spread around your rib cage. So the goal of diaphragmatic breath, as we discussed before, is not just the belly breathing. The one we've just done is belly breathing. But a 360 degree breath is the actual goal. So a full cylinder of the rib cage expanding. So once we know we can belly breathe, hopefully you've achieved that a little bit or you may need some practice on that. But once you have achieved it, we also need to focus on lateral expansion with this exercise. So we're going to really think about breathing into the sides of the rib cage, so into your hands that you've wrapped around the side of your ribs there. You're going to breathe into the base of your lungs and out into the sides. So if we use visualization for this one as well, continuing that breath in, pause, out, pause for me. We're going to imagine that your ribs are moving a little bit like an accordion when it's played. So your hands are on the side of that accordion. So you should feel your ribs expand into your hands like an accordion was being played as you breathe in. So hopefully now the breath is coming down into the belly and then out into those ribs. So we've got that 360 degree breath. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to scoot along quite quickly just because we've only got an hour with our time frame. And I'm going to get you to stand back up again and then sit back down on your seat for me for our final little exercise. Because it's really important to be able to breathe in all different postures and positions. We've just done that 90-90 position. And now I'd like to give you an exercise for seated, but you can do this standing, you can do this lying, you can do this one in any position. Because just because you can breathe in one position doesn't mean that you're breathing efficiently in all positions. So I'm gonna teach you box breathing technique, which is one of Sam's absolute favorites as well. And this can help you focus on your breathing and it helps activate the positive benefits of good breathing technique. So hopefully you're all sat back up again. And if you can shuffle yourself to the front of your chair, pop your feet flat on the floor, hip distance apart, making sure that you're sitting with nice posture as well, rather than slouching. So let's imagine we've got a string on the top of our head and that string is being pulled right up to the ceiling and that's going to elongate that spine so you're in a nice postural position whilst you're sat here. 
you're still going to focus on breathing down into the base of your lungs so that your belly rises and also out into the sides and the back of the rib cage. 360 degree breath. But what we're going to be looking at is a three second rule. So you're going to breathe in for three seconds, filling those lungs, then pause for three seconds with full lungs. Breathe out for three seconds, emptying your lungs. And then pause for three seconds, keeping your lungs empty. And then we continue again, breathing in for three seconds. Out for three seconds, keeping your lungs full. Sorry, pause for three seconds. And then out for three seconds. And then pause for three seconds. So it's a three second rule, creating that box in, pause, out, pause. So this is a really simple and easy technique. And in order to stimulate optimal breathing patterns, the more we repeat the process, the more skilled your body is going to become at utilizing that more natural and optimal diaphragmatic breath. So over time, using these exercises is helping us reset our natural breathing techniques. And this method of breathing then can become automatic again and optimal as it used to be when we were kids. So this is a really brilliant movement snack, this box breathing to incorporate during your working day. Because what you can see and imagine is that you can pretty much perform box breathing at any time and anywhere. So I'm now going to hand back to Sam and she will continue on with this webinar. Um, and just quickly with that um, box breathing. Yeah, I had a client. Um, thanks, Laura, for sharing with everybody. I've got, a, I've got a client who had his own business who came to one of my courses. He does that box breathing in his car when he gets home from work. And he box breathes um, as, as a dad. And then in the morning, he leaves the house and he gets outside his work. And he box breathes outside of work and he leaves dad in the car and he goes in as um, as the business owner. So it's a really useful tool that you can use for a lot of different things. Just between, as a human, between the stimulus um, we have um, and response, there's this space. And this space is where we have the power to choose our response. And this is what make, makes us specialist humans. In that response gives us the chance for us to grow. And so this is managing to actually um, become aware of that, that space is one of the key things about when we're aware and then being able to have a chance to do something about it in that stress response. So day to day to help manage stress, um, we don't need to do the handle everything alone, drink more, smoke more and take up other bad habits. We really want to keep things as simple as possible. And it is really focusing on those good lifestyle choices, um, eating whole food, sleeping well and spending time with people you love. Spending time to relax, as we mentioned earlier, we relax in our own way. So becoming more aware of what that is. Um, I love lists, my husband hates lists, uh, but when we're stressed, actually prioritizing time and writing a list about what's the most important things to get done can help prevent you becoming more overwhelmed. Um, you can also um, use that to really be able to not try and please everybody and learn how to maybe say no at this time. And when you're back on track of everything and everything's going great again, then throw yourself into life the way you, you might ordinarily do. Um, accepting the things we can't change is a really um, crucial tool and I'm going to give you some tools for that in a minute. And as we all know, and it's talked of a lot, we have to really communicate with others if our stress is becoming too overwhelming and we can't see a way out of it. Now, whether that's friends, family, um, people that have been through something similar to yourself or a professional, um, actually, that's one of the biggest things that we can do to really help ourselves. But while managing lifestyle factors and day-to-day -day planning are great ways to improve the stress that we're currently feeling, there's a few things we can really work on to actively reduce and enable us to manage stress in the long run. So we've covered becoming more aware, we've covered some breathing exercises, and so we're just quickly going to touch on becoming more mindful, 
reframing situations and prioritizing positivity. So mindfulness, now we don't all need to wear yoga pants and we don't need to hug trees to become more mindful. It's purely the art of just bringing more awareness into what's happening right now in the present moment. And it's a really effective tool for reducing stress right now. We just want to learn to be and be aware of what's going on um, a little bit more. And a really easy way to distinguish the difference between being mode and doing mode is maybe when we learn to drive. When we first start driving, we were very much all hands, all feet, aware of what's outside the car, what's inside the car, and couldn't possibly think about anything else. And then 20 years on, well, yeah, we can talk to the kids, pass them snacks, have a coffee, do all these other things and really don't remember the drive. So learning just to be more aware of what's going on around you is um, a skill that we lose as we get busy and we spend more and more of our life in doing mode. The classic is the coffee and the mobile phone. How many people actually taste the coffee they've bought if they're spending the whole time just on Facebook or, or something similar? There are four different types of uh, meditation that, um, uh, well, there are, there are lots of different types of meditation, but I'm just going to cover four really quickly just to highlight the differences and see a bit of an idea. So mindfulness. This is paying attention to our thoughts as they come through our mind. Less about clearing our mind and more about just being aware that those thoughts are coming in and that they can leave again. And this is where the real power comes when you actually become aware thoughts that can come in. You can actually let go of them and they don't actually need to become part of you. Um, a lot of the things that we see on apps, um, uh, this sort of mindfulness meditation. Spiritual meditation, well, evidence of meditation has been around for six to seven thousand years. Through Eastern religions, such as Buddhism, we've become more aware of the practice. But even in the Christian faith, things like praying, are, it seems like a focused meditation. And spirituality isn't necessarily all about religion, but can be all about connecting either with the universe or, as I'm sure you guys are all aware, with nature. And in this case, it can be really relevant if you're out on the farm and you really become connected with how your stock are doing and how they're faring. Um, you know, regardless of, of the situation they've been put in, and you really start to form that connection between what's happening between yourself and the land and, and the animals that you're growing. Focus meditations when we use the five senses, uh, so it's things we can see, taste, touch, feel. Um, and this can be something as simple as really focusing on eating our food. Um, and we're gonna have a little practice of that in a minute. Um, but also touching the ground and noticing, no noticing things that are going on and making a concerted effort to notice things more. And for those of us that like to be more of an active relaxer, some sort of form of movement meditation is often really good. Um, anybody that's wanting a bit of a business opportunity, this farm in Massachusetts is doing goat yoga. Um, I'm sure they'd be more than happy to talk to you about um, whether it's a success or not. So, but these are things like Tai Chi, yoga, but also just moving in nature. The Japanese do a lot of forest bathing where they move very slowly through the forest, really feeling, seeing, touching things around them. We just learn to be present in the moment more and it doesn't mean accepting the things we're not happy with. It just means that we're just learning to be more aware of the things going on around us. So I'd like you to get your little piece of food and pop it in your hand and just take a really good look at it notice its shape its color its size its texture maybe touch it with the other hand and then bring it up to your nose and smell it and make a note of, of how it smells if you pop it on your tongue don't, don't chew it, just pop it on the tongue and see how it feels in your mouth. See maybe if you're getting a little bit more saliva and see if there are any tastes that you're starting to be able to um, get through there. And then maybe just take one or two chews. Do you notice any difference in the flavours? Do you notice any difference in the texture? Do you notice any difference in the response of your salivary glands? And now feel free to swallow the food. 
and feel the sensation of the food as it goes down your throat. Now we're a little bit short on time. I normally spend a little bit longer doing this, but when I do this with groups, especially with chocolate, it's often commented upon that it took far longer to eat that piece than it usually takes to eat the whole bar. So if we're moving into just really simple ways that we can be more mindful at home, quite simple things, sit on a different seat while you're watching the telly or having your dinner, drive a different route, turn off the TV, Try eating mindfully, and this can be really lovely when you actually start thinking about how the food was produced and where it's come from, as well as the tastes and the flavours and all of those things. But actually think about earth to table could be a really lovely practice. Taste that cup of coffee. Look at the view while you're out on farm. Move, feel the ground under your feet. And these three apps here, Headspace, Calm and Meditation Studio, are all pretty common and um, pretty well-known apps that all offer um, a certain amount of free time that you can actually do to have, have a go. Um, most of them only take 10 or 15 minutes a day and people can be quite surprised by how much effect it has on actually helping you, just becoming aware of the fact that your thoughts aren't you. Reframing or changing the narrative is another quick way that we can look at it. And it's quite simple. We've got questions like, is this going to make any difference in a month or a year from now? Um, some of it will, and then it's obviously worth putting the time and energy in, but a lot of things won't. We can reframe stressful situations. I know that when I had the sign writing shop, um, I really didn't enjoy it until one day I decided I wasn't a sign writer. I was helping people market their businesses. What I did nine to five didn't change at all, but how I thought about the job and how stressed and upset I was when I went home were completely different because I had a different feeling about what I was doing. We talked earlier about whether things are real and by testing those thoughts, that can be a great way. And by developing that problem solving mindset and using that um, outside part of our brain, um, we can really learn to solve some problems for ourselves. And the easiest way to do this is just imagine that you're your friend coming and asking for advice and what advice would you give them? It's a lot easier to take the emotion out of it when you think you're doing it for somebody else. And lastly, add in some positive emotion. And this has been shown right the way through to have really, really good effects on mental health over the long term, as well as physical health. <coughs> If we prioritize positivity, the psychologist that wrote this has shown that we start to switch on resilience genes. Again, we can't stop the shit happening that's gonna happen in our world, but we can have some influence on how we handle it. We're gonna prioritize positivity, and that's just doing more of what you enjoy. And the other way that we can increase our positive emotions is by bringing a gratitude practice in. Now I've got a lovely little clip on my Facebook page that you can a video of about three minutes that tells you for, far more about how to actually practice that gratitude um, and get it um, as a successful part of, of not every day, but once or twice a week, it can have a really significant boost to your mental health. And that's not just while you're doing it, but those effects go on months and, and months after. So to finish, um, I just really like to, use the key takeaways that I'd like, which um, you can see two of them are the most popular. One's becoming aware. Two, making sure that we're breathing well. Third, yet yeah, try to be present more often. And a lot of you would put actually just being more mindful in day-to-day -day life. And four, prioritizing that positivity. These things um, can have such a huge mental and physical boost um, to you that they're absolutely amazing things to take away and make part of your everyday life. These things aren't necessarily always easy and next week um, we're going to look at how we can help you make some behaviour changes and how that works to try and help you introduce some of these things in your life if it's not going quite so easy. Laura's going to run through a few more movement snacks that are going to really help enhance lifestyle. Um, we look forward to catching up with you again then.